So, welcome to our nice big pop, big, big pipe talk today. Um, I hope you all had a great DrupalCon so far, and I hope we can start this morning after the keynote uh, with a nice little session for you. So, what is this big pipe thing? And I know, because I saw it this morning. Actually, it was not me, but him, but anyway. Um, here in New Orleans, this is a big pipe. <laughs> so, um, no, 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 I know, no, no, no. This time I get it right, it's this. This is a big pipe. Um, no. Okay, but maybe this. Mm. Or this. Is this a big pipe? We have some, no. um, not really what we are thinking about. So, um, I know, I know, I know. This time I got it. It's a pipe of a steamboat. It's this. This is big pipe. Um, nope, wrong again. Okay. This time I'm really, really, really sure because I saw this interview with this Fabian Franz. Um, it is the Gandalf's big pipe. <laughs> They're smoking rings and uh, maybe not. So um, what Big Pipe is, and if you ever wondered why is there this um, kind of thing with the streams and water and everything, you remember Drupal is in actually a drop. So this is kind of how a new, how a page request is looking like. You are having this Drupalicon and this is your page and you always have to wait a moment and then it comes in one big blob. So um, this is how page handling at the moment, Drupal 7, Drupal 8 works. But now, if you are using Drupal 8.1, who of you uses Drupal 8.1 already? Okay, cool. Some people have already started. Um, and who of you have tried out Big Pipe already? Some people. The rest, hopefully, all after the session, because it's exciting. Um, then this actually changes to this. So it gets much faster, and you see there's not just one drop, but there's several drops of, of data. And how that works in detail, that we'll just explain in the session. Yeah, good morning. Um, so we'll be talking about BigPipe and explain you from a very high level to some level of detail so that it should be clear to anybody, even if there's people here who don't use Drupal, it should be understandable. Because really it's, it's not something that is highly Drupal specific, it is something that is a technique that we brought to Drupal and made work in a way that you don't have to think about, made it work in a way that you don't have to write custom code for it. So we'll take you through it, um, and hopefully by the, end of the, by the end of the session, you will all want to try it out um, and see what it's about. So BigPipe is related to performance. And when talking about performance, I'm sure any, well, every, every single one of you have uh, considered the differences between front end and back end. And front end is, of course, about the, the fetching, the parsing, the executing, the rendering of CSS, JavaScript, images, fonts, all sorts of assets. And the back end, traditionally, well, in fact, it is only about HTML. So basically, the front end has to do lots of things dealing with all those assets, and the back end has to do just one thing. HTML. Um, and so that actually already kind of suggests it, but really in reality, 80 to 90% of the time that it takes to render a page to actually do a request to seeing something useful on the screen is spent on the front end, not on the back end. And so we really can make far bigger gains on the front end in terms of speed rather than on the back end. And we very often forget about that. That is still a relevant thing. And the other aspect here that we um, are aware of, but not everybody is always considering, is performance versus perceived performance. Because performance, usually what we think about in terms of performance is how many milliseconds does it take to generate a response? Uh, is that really the thing that really matters? In the end, it actually is not that important. What matters is the perceived performance. How fast does a page feel? How fast do you see something that is useful on the page, even if not maybe every single detail has been loaded? So perceived performance is the thing that really matters. Why don't we think about it more? Because it's far more difficult to measure. We measure the things that are easy to measure. We measure the time to generate a response. We measure the time until the entire page is loaded, the window load events. But that's not really what matters in the end. So perceived performance is something we should be talking about more. And that's what is really relevant for BigPipe because that is what it improves. So a few measures that are very valuable are 
these four, and they're in the order of uh, being relevant while handling a page request and loading a page. The time to first byte. So that's the time between doing a request and starting to receive the very first byte of the response. So the total waiting time until you get something back from the server. The next one, uh, TTAP, time to asset prefetching. That's the one you will not see in probably any other presentation. Um, it's one that is particularly relevant for BigPipe because that is the thing that it, it enhances the most, if you will. Uh, because browsers actually are able to start fetching uh, assets, so the CSS that is in the top of the page, the JavaScript that is mentioned in the top of the page, and is able to start fetching those even if maybe the bottom of the HTML is not yet available. So time to asset prefetching is super important because it allows the browser to start doing work while the rest is still arriving, and that is absolutely key, particularly for BigPipe. TTI is something that you will see in many presentations and many companies, but sadly only the bigger uh, companies with, with big software engineering departments, if you will, are actually using this, this measurement. Because in the end, what matters is the time to being able to do the interaction you are there to do. Whether it is accessing or, or reading a blog post, whether it is being able to use a particular form, whether it is the ability to start interacting with a fancy to-do application and start being able to um, enter a new to-do entry. So the time to interaction really depends on the particular application. But that is really the thing that matters because if maybe some detail far down on the page is not yet available until maybe two seconds in, but the actual interaction is available right away in half a second, that is what really matters. So depending on your use case, for the very most important things on your side, ideally you would define what is the interaction I care about and start measuring when that becomes available. That is what really matters and that's where BigPipe helps significantly. And then the last one, the page load time. That's just the total load time that we all know. That's still important to make sure that you don't have anything excessive that is taking minutes to load, for example. So it's still a relevant thing, but it's important to also look at the other measures. And so when trying to make your website faster, the typical, the traditional front-end optimization still applies, so optimizing images, minifying JavaScript and CSS, fewer HTTP requests, and yes, that also still matters in HTTP2, sadly, <laughs> until today. The promise is that we wouldn't have to think about that anymore at all, but today, the proof shows otherwise. Hopefully it's just a matter of optimizing our HTTP2 clients and servers, but for now, all of the typical optimizations are still relevant and still necessary. But if we do those front-end optimizations, they, they actually matter, because typically 80 to 90% of the, the time to generate or show a page, rather, is uh, spent on the front end, but if the back end is already very slow, say it takes half a second, a full second, maybe even multiple seconds, which is not unheard of in the Drupal world or outside of Drupal, sadly, then the front end being super fast, let's say the entire front end can load in 0.1 seconds, superb, but you're already taking two seconds to just get an initial response, so it doesn't really matter anymore. And so what, what Big Pipe is about is that intersection of front end and back end performance. BigPipe cannot magically make something that takes 20 seconds, say. Everything, it cannot make something that takes 20 seconds available completely in one second. It's impossible because it was taking 20 seconds. But what BigPipe can do is bring up a lot of the things that aren't taking those 20 seconds, but the parts that are actually the same across users, it can bring that uh, to the end user much faster, which means that the browser can start rendering that part, which means the browser can start fetching assets, start rendering images, and so on, much faster. And so BigPipe is really at the intersection of front-end and back-end performance. So a concrete example would be BigPipe versus traditional, so the traditional page loading model. Traditional only does the con doesn't send anything until the very end, so it, it's calculating, 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 and then it sends everything. BigPipe, on the other hand, it starts a bit of initial HTML so that assets can start to be fetched. Then it sends another chunk of HTML, another chunk of HTML until it's complete. So it's, it's taking the same total amount of time, but it's delivering it in a far more efficient way. So concretely speaking, that would mean, for example, that your page header with the menus and the title, the logo, is visible very, very fast, 150 milliseconds to the screen, um, instead of 350 maybe, or maybe even more. Just one concrete example. Um, so really changing the backend can improve perceived performance, and that's what, what this is about. So Fabian is going to talk now a bit about the differences between BigPipe and other systems to improve performance. Okay, so uh, what we're doing here is we are comparing uh, different things. 
Um, there's kind of, um, in, in Drupal 8, we've integrated several methods to do things. Um, obviously, there can be code caches, so there can be a uncached page, or someone says, well, who needs this caching? We just turn it off. Um, then, obviously, we have the page cache, which has been in Drupal since Drupal 3.1. Um, so that had always been kind of at the heart of Drupal, um, but with Drupal 8, the page cache has become way more awesome, thanks to Wim and other contributors. And then there's dynamic page cache, which was made possible by the whole caching re-architecture we integrated, um, uh, which is working so transparently to you that you don't even notice usually. And then there's obviously big pipe, and we'll compare how um, those different methods have different um, latency times for the measures that uh, Wim had already laid out. So uh, for the uncached regular page, um, the Drupal needs to do a lot of things before replying because um, the backend is doing everything and uh, calculating everything. Here's a node, here's a block, here's something. Here's another thing it needs to render. So you have typically hundreds of milliseconds on the back end. So kind of all the time to first buy, time to the assets prefetching, the time to the that the user can interact can be really far, uh, slow in that. So um, And what then happens is kind of that dreaded the user clicks on a link and the page is loading, loading. Or if he's coming first to your page, it's that dreaded white screen where the user is seeing that white screen. And there are studies that if a user sees such white screen, it takes way too long. They're just closing the window and going to some competition now. Um, the page cache, um, there Drupal <coughs> needs to do almost nothing before replying. We usually have time to first bytes smaller than 10 milliseconds. Obviously, there's always network latency. Um, then um, because we are sending this whole chunk like that Drupalicon you saw, we are sending it directly. Um, there, obviously, the browser can directly start fetching the assets as well. And depending on your front end code, how much JavaScript you have, how much you are initializing on the page, the time to interact can be hundreds of milliseconds or less. Um, in Drupal 8, um, we've made it so that um, for anonymous users, there's no JavaScript on the page, so we don't have to deal with that, and then the time to interact is, is much faster. So um, especially with CSS3 animations and other things that uh, made CSS so rich, it can be very well worthwhile to say we are trying a no JavaScript site for some of our pages because um, that can improve the user experience. Um, then there's a dynamic page cache, and um, that's new. <laughs> it's especially important if you have authenticated users, um, and it transparently works in the background. However, the way we've very securely, very safely integrated the page a dynamic page cache quite late in the game of Drupal 8, um, there's a little more work to be done, so the time to first byte is more within the 10 seconds to level hundreds of milliseconds thing. There are, however, initiatives to change that, so there might be improvements in the future here. Um, we just want to make sure this is very carefully just working for you so that you never have to worry about it. Um, and then, obviously, the time to SH prefetch is also within the hundreds of milliseconds and the time to interact is pretty high. So that's for authenticated users, and that's all nice. Um, but um, with the dynamic page cache, what we have, we have a page um, which has um, all the information. But for certain things, we are coming to that a little later, there are things that are, for example, personalized or otherwise um, um, not fast or not cacheable. In such things, we have placeholders for, but actually we have to execute those placeholders when we are getting something out of the dynamic page cache. So let's say you have one slow block, one slow block on, on the page that's uncacheable, but your um, uh, CTO, your CEO, all the bosses are saying, we need this block. It's so important to our business. But it's making your whole page slow. And um, that's kind of sad in, in everything. Because um, we are kind of, we know the data, and then we 
have it already, and that's where Big Pipe comes in. Because with Big Pipe, we are just sending everything we have, and then we are rendering your slow block, and then we are sending it once we have it. Um, so, and that's how we can have, um, I was, I'm liking to speak of that, like the fastest Drupal ever in that with Big Pipe, because then we can have for authenticated users time to first bytes of low tens of milliseconds, um, typically like 1540. Uh, the time to asset prefetching is then also within the tens of milliseconds, because we are sending what we have as soon as possible in the time to interact, depending again on your front end hundreds of milliseconds. So especially for the authenticated users, this slide still says it's a candidate for Drupal 8.1 or 8.2, but actually it's in 8.1 as an experimental module. You can play with it today. Isn't that nice? Yeah, and here's a nice little demo uh, of Big Pipe. So, um, in this scenario, there are several things that are personalized, slow, and such, and cacheable, because on this music website, we want to give recommendations, and as Dree said in his keynote, it's always important to give much more uh, streamlined things, but as you see, big pipes already there, while the traditional model is still calculating in the background, and that's what I said. There's one slow, really business important bug, uh, block that's, um, making your whole site slow, but with, but with big pipe, you can just wait until the blocks to appear in the end. But what's a uh, misdifference um, that sometimes thought is that big pipe is making the server response time faster. No, it's not making it faster. It takes the exact same time in the end, but we are using it more intelligently by ensuring that things we can already send, we have been sending. Um, and that's pretty cool in that. And um, even if you have users, for example, accessibility concerns or such, that have JavaScript disabled, there's a big pipe light version uh, enabled within Drupal by default. Then it will, for example, just send the page to that certain block or whatever in, within the dome that it can send, generate the content, and send the rest. So even with JavaScript disabled, you can re some of the benefits of Big Pipe in that. Okay. Okay, so at a high level, how does that whole thing work? How did we manage to do something that Facebook has been doing since 2010 and other big enterprises like LinkedIn have been starting to be doing? And um, I just saw on Flickr, they are also doing some Big Pipe stuff now. Um, but huge enterprises have huge budgets. How can it be that now every Drupal 8 site can profit from this by just enabling the model? And um, the answer to that is cacheability metadata. And that's basically dependencies. You are telling Drupal how to invalidate, when to invalidate, and how you are varying things. Um, to get into that a little mehr, more um, concretely, Cache tags are your data dependencies. I mean, you all know that scenario. You are having a web page, and it has this one title on all of the pages, everywhere. And now the boss comes and says, this title is totally not acceptable. But you are in a huge traffic rush because all people are visiting your website. So your only option kind of is because you don't know where the title appears is to do a Drupal flush all caches, drush cc all. And that obviously will lead to big problems for your visitors because they are then like, oh my god, um, a Drupal needs to rebuild all the caches and it's not necessary. So um, how did Drupal 8 solve that? The thing is, in Drupal 8, the editor, very relaxed, goes to the node, edits the title, saves, and all pages are automatically, all blocks, all views, everything is automatically expired where that one title ex was, but nothing else. And that's what cache tags do. You are tagging your content, and with that kind of relationship of data dependencies to rendered content, you are able to do that, and you never have to worry about that scenario anymore. And with uh, the... <laughs> 
And because everything in Drupal is cache tagged, the same works for your Vanish server. No more nightly cron jobs where you are going a huge list of URLs that you are clearing from a CDN. Or if some people have used some big proprietary um, uh, CDNs um, as well, um, then you might know that it takes like three to four hours until all edge nodes in the whole of the network are cleared, which is very bad if things happen like um, like white um, bugs where a CSS file does not appear or something. And there are other CDNs, however, that um, have immediate invalidation. And um, CDNs that are supporting such called surrogate keys, uh, like for example, Fastly, which was the other one? Um, Cloudflare. Cloudflare. Um, those CDNs like um, Drupal is using a special module. For Fastly, you would install the Fastly module. For Cloud, for the Cloudflare module. And then it's sending a special header. And then again, your content editor is changing that. The CDN gets a special command. And again, you don't have to worry that that person in Asia is still seeing that old title. So again, it's kind of solved. Um, cache contexts are your context dependencies. Um, if you've worked with Drupal 7, um, there was a possibility for blocks to specify some basic caching. You could say this is cached by user, or this is cached by permissions, this is cached by role, um, this is cached by URL, by page, but it was not very granular. and. Um, it was also sometimes problematic because if you were caching one block per user, for example, then suddenly your whole page was only cacheable by user and you could no longer really use um, any page cache in that. And that resolved with placeholders we're coming to a little later. Um, but context dependencies means you are telling Drupal how your content varies. My content varies on the face of the moon, or my content varies on some strange Indian ritual um, that's done uh, some time, which is a very complex proprietary calculation. And um, you can do that. You can just put in a cache context service for your needs. You need to um, change something, buy some cookie. You can do that right now. You need to vary your content by a device, mobile. It's just a cache context away. Um, so this has been become much more simple because we've created kind of like this cacheability metadata language. And then obviously there are things where you say this should only ever be valid for five minutes. You are, you, so you are setting a max age of five minutes. Uh, yeah, and, and one of the nicer things in Drupal 8, um, one of the huge achievements we've uh, made there is um, that this cacheability metadata is actually bubbled up during rendering. That means we have this render tree, um, but we have things um, that might be way below in that tree. Um, and, but even if one of your blocks, and it's not placeholder, is varied by the moon, we ensure that your whole page is then varied by the moon face. So that all caches are synchronized in that way. And that was a pretty big challenge, but we made it. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, as I said, um, cache text works perfectly with the reverse proxy. We did talk about that in a lot more detail um, last year in, um, at DrupalCon Spain, uh, Barcelona. So um, there's this talk at Wim's page to look at. So if you are interested in authenticated user caching in the CDN, check out that talk. Um, oh yeah, and here we come to one of the coolest thing uh, which is like the um, rendering in isolation, which is the lazy builders and the auto placeholdering. So one of the big problems we had was, um, let's say we have like this user block and we have um, our page. And what happened in Drupal 7 in that user block, you would put in a user object. That user object would have a field. That field would have another node selected. So you would have like this big chunk of data and you would need to put that in that would be very inefficient. So um, what we did is we said, that's not how it's going to work. There was a huge problem within the pre-render cache pattern. We are introducing something new that's a lazy builder. And we are ensuring that whatever parameters you give are either cache context or those parameters you are inserting into the lazy builder have to be scalar values. 
So you cannot just put in an object and everything and then say, well, Drupal will serialize it somehow and do something. But we say, if you want to render that block one, then you have to do a lazy builder and then you have to just put in block one not like a block object. And then you have to load the block object. But because we have that independence, now things like ESI get easy. Now things like um, placeholdering get easy. Now things like dynamic page cache get so simple. And then we have this really nice auto placeholder conditions that we are saying that, for example, you are having this block which is varying by session. So you cannot use a normal Drupal page cache, but you really need this block to be varied by the session because there's some shopping cart or whatever. But there's still the dynamic page cache to help you out because that one has a placeholder and this block placeholder for the session. But so that you do not need to do this yourself, what we've made possible is we have auto placeholdering. That means you tell Drupal how things vary and Drupal is smart enough to figure out if something varies by session, you probably don't want your whole page to be varied by session because it's a high frequency cache context that would lead to millions of entries of data. So Drupal is auto placeholdering that for you, putting a placeholder in, then it can be dynamic page cache cached, and then for your anonymous users where your normal page cache wouldn't work, um, you can still um, have that work because you get that page out of the dynamic page cache and then just render this one block in isolation that's um, per session. Yeah. That's the thing. Um, those two things make that possible. And then you can even big pipe it as a next step because why not just send the page already if you have it already outside there? Right here. Okay, and here you see again that in a very nice uh, diagram made by Sean McCabe, um, which really makes, uh, shows that your user is getting so much more if you having like already all the header, all the products, your footer shown and you are gradually building up the page for him, then if he has to wait um, until this page has finally loaded, because waiting, 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 waiting. I'm going to close that side. <laughs> okay. So, and now uh, Vim will show you how to use that thing. Cable problems here. Um, so, Fabian went into a little bit more detail than was the goal at this stage, but uh, hopefully that was okay. Um, so, Given that you already have an, a good idea now how BigPipe is able to work using cacheability metadata, the ability to render in isolation, um, how can you actually start using all of this? How can you try BigPipe on your Drupal site? Well, it is, as Fabian mentioned earlier in the very beginning, it is very simple. You just install a module. There is nothing to configure because all of the things that it needs in order to be able to function are provided by the APIs that Drupal 8 itself has deep in its render system. <coughs> And everything that is rendered is already supposed to provide cacheability metadata. Based on the cacheability metadata, Drupal is able to decide which parts are, too, are, are not good to cache because they would cause so many variations that it would not be efficient anymore. So given all of that, BigPipe can just work without any configuration at all because it is just building upon the concepts and the patterns that we brought into Drupal core um, itself. So in Drupal, if you're on Drupal 8.0, uh, which is the vast majority of you I saw, um, installed a BigPipe contrib module. It is kept in sync with Drupal 8.1, and as Fabian also mentioned, BigPipe did get committed to Drupal 8.1 as an experimental module. Um, the goal is to get as much exposure as possible, to get as many people to try it as possible. We want to make sure that there is no edge cases that we are unaware of. We want to make sure it works in every single case, that it never can break your sites. So far, it is looking very good. We are getting very few bug reports, like literally less than a handful, um, and only tiny things that are very easy to resolve. Um, so that it's looking very good, but we want you to try it in even your craziest setups. Hopefully you don't have a crazy setup, but in case you do, we want to make sure it works even in those cases. So just go and install it. Um, however, it's very possible that you're saying, well, I'm not sure I want to trust this on my production site. Yeah, you shouldn't try it on production immediately, of course, but try the Big Pipe demo. Uh, there is a, a demo posted on my website, and you can just go there. So it's bigpipe.demo.wimlears.com. 
You click start session because BigPipe only works for authenticated users. For anonymous users, the page cache is much faster. It, it's able to send a response right away, so there's no point in using BigPipe even. And then once you've done that, you can just, uh, let's say I, I've got two blocks here, two demo blocks, demo one and demo two. Let's say I want to make the first one take 0.1 seconds and the second one 0.2 seconds. So as you can see, um, it is showing the, the overall page immediately and then the, the rest is showing up later. BigPipe works for any block automatically out of the box because the block, the way blocks are, um, the, the way the block API works in Drupal 8, it guarantees that any block can be rendered in isolation, which means it can be delivered by BigPipe. So try it. Install the BigPipe demo module, this one. Uh, try either the website, the demo here, which is relatively limited, of course, but you can play with uh, different durations for, for the two blocks that are placed there. You can install it using simply test with me, so you don't even have to install it locally if you don't want to. Um, but the really cool thing is if you do install it locally or on simply test with me, you can configure these blocks to have different HTML so that the HTML resembles your particular site, your particular use cases, so you can better get a better sense of what it would feel like to, to use BigPipe in those cases. Like if it's a very important piece of content that is in there, how does it feel if it shows up later? Do I need to make design adjustments? Those kinds of things. And you can just play with the query string to turn it off to really observe the difference between BigPipe enabled or not very easily. So to get started, try the BigPipe demo. But the, the message here is just give it a try because you have nothing to lose. There's only two kind of problems that you may encounter. Um, the first one would be jumpiness. Like, it is a valid concern that because BigPipe is, is causing content to show up later, well, that might cause some jumpiness depending on how your site design works. Because it's in certain content in a certain place, if the place was not reserved, it could cause some content to be pushed down. Um, well, in that case, you should probably make your CSS more robust because it's not really a problem really induced by BigPipe. Usually, it is the same problem when your site is being loaded on a slower connection, on 3G, on Edge, while you're on a train, um, the page is loaded partially, and then more is coming, more, more is being received, more is being rendered, and then all the th oh, things are jumping around all the time, <laughs> like I just did myself. Um, that's the thing you want to fix anyway. So if you fix it for a big pipe, it's just more prevalent, it's more easy to observe with big pipe, but you actually should be testing with slower connections anyway, so just fix those situations, and then you don't have any problem there. The only other thing you may encounter is that something is not being delivered via BigPipe. It works automatically for any block that you create, any custom block, custom code blocks also. Um, so in that case, I would say simulate it first in the BigPipe demo. Like, the, the generated HTML, put that in the block, see what it feels like, um, and then you have a sense. But then the next step would be to fix your code um, and use a lazy builder, as Fabian explained. So this is pretty much the entire set of problems you could have. Either jumpiness, which is a problem you should have fixed anyway and it makes it easier to observe it, or slow code is not being delivered by BigPipe. Well, in that case, you just need to adjust the code. But the usual cases, actually, you won't need to do that. So really, the message is play, analyze, simulate, and adopt. Uh, play with it to see what the difference can be. Analyze your particular site. Does it have uncacheable content? Does it have personalized content? If so, you probably want to simulate it and uh, install the BigPipe module itself and just try it locally on, on a testing environment. Or install the BigPipe demo module on a vanilla Drupal site and see what the difference it could make. And then when you try to adopt it, you may need to fix a bit of cacheability metadata if you have custom code and you didn't specify the correct cacheability metadata. Like for example, if something is actually varying by user or it is varying by session, but you didn't specify that corresponding cache context. BigPipe doesn't know, Drupal doesn't know, and so it may end up caching incorrectly. Well, in that case, you need to fix that, but that's about it. So, given that you now have an idea of how to start playing with it, which is just very simple, give it a try. You, you don't have to do anything complex. Next step is, like, how does it actually work? How is Drupal able to do this in some more detail? So th there's four key parts to this, and Fabian already mentioned a few. But let's put them together to have a better sense of how they actually interact with each other and how they help bring us to the point that we can do this automatically. Because as, as Fabian mentioned before, there's actually others. Let me go back one slide, actually, to not let you read it just yet. Um, LinkedIn is using it. Facebook is using it. There's custom code for Scala. There is custom code you can write for uh, 
Node.js, there's lots of different implementations, but the one thing they share is that you need to write custom code in order to be able to use BigPipe. You specifically, every part of the page that you want to deliver via BigPipe, you need to write custom code to mark it up in a certain special way and call special callbacks and whatnot. You don't need to do any of that in Drupal. The only thing you need to do is provide cacheability metadata and make sure it's renderable in isolation. And so that is a very key difference between other systems and Drupal, because Drupal really wants to make sure that site builders are also able to achieve cool things. This is pretty cool. This is not achievable with any, anything else, because otherwise you need to know how to code, and not just basic code, pretty complex code. So the four things that are key, cacheability metadata, so the tags, context, and maxage, plus bubbling, the bubbling of those three things. So that describes the dependencies. We need to know the dependencies in order to know whether something should be rendered later or not, whether it is personalized or not. That's what that tells us. Then the ability to render in isolation, just like you have pre-render callbacks in Drupal 7 and before, which still exist in Drupal 8, by the way, the difference between pre-render and lazy builder is at first sight small. They, do, they serve similar purposes, but the difference is that pre-render has zero restrictions. So you can pass around objects, which means it's not actually renderable in isolation. Usually pre-render callbacks are calling into global state, and that's what prevents us from delivering it later. So lazy builder callbacks ensure us, guarantee us that it can be rendered later. Auto placeholdering, if the first two, cacheability metadata and isolated rendering, are both met, and the cacheability metadata indicates that it's poorly cacheable, so either completely not cacheable, or cacheable per user, which may cause millions of variations, or, or varying by session, which can cause even more variations. Well, in those cases, we want to turn it into a placeholder so it doesn't slow the rest of the page down. And so auto placeholdering relies on the first two. And then finally, placeholder strategies. So we have those placeholders already in Drupal Core. Even without BigPipe, Drupal Core relies on placeholders that are replaced at the very last second um, to be able to serve pages efficiently and cache the majority of the pages efficiently in the dynamic page cache. So by default, Drupal 8, as it does today, is it replaces the placeholders in the response just before, completing, uh, before sending the complete response. So it has everything, the HTML, ready. Let's say it took one second to keep it easy, to, stay, uh, to keep it simple. Um, and then there's still a bunch of placeholders in there, like, like say, for example, the high user or the, um, the shopping cart or any of those kinds of things. And then it replaces all of them and then sends the entire result in one go. That's the current strategy. But BigPipe just adds a new strategy. And the strategy is very similar. It receives uh, the overall HTML response with still the placeholders, but it then sends it right away. It doesn't wait until every placeholder has been rendered. It sends that right away and then renders each individual placeholder. And as soon as it becomes ready, it sends it over. So that's just it. <coughs> Uh, Drupal already provides the infrastructure to have different strategies. BigPipe is just an additional one. So conceptually speaking, what BigPipe does is it sends the initial page directly from, and it gets it from the dynamic page cache. So page cache and BigPipe are kind of on the same level in terms of optimization in the sense that page cache is as fast as you can get for anonymous users. It's just, it's completely ready. Drupal assumes that the, the, the responses are the same for all anonymous users. So that's what page cache does. It's as fast as it can get. BigPipe, um, it layers on top of the dynamic page cache, which can cache the skeleton, the parts of the page that are not placeholders. And so then BigPipe can send that right away. It just receives it from dynamic page cache and sends it. And then it starts sending the BigPipe placeholders in the order they appear in the DOM. So conceptually speaking, um, these two things are all that BigPipe does. And conceptually speaking, that's all you need to know. If you want to learn more about the technical details, this intimidating diagram is uh, awaiting you. Uh, it's called the Drupal 8 Render Pipeline, which explains in perhaps excruciatingly detail um, how it all works. It also explains BigPipe. It explains it's not in a big pipe specific way. This is just a full Drupal 8 render pipeline from bootstrap to serving a response until the very last byte, until the very last moment. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, it's documented on drupal.org. There's a talk about that as well if you are interested in that. And then the very, very important thing is that unlike, uh, well, Fabian already mentioned, Facebook, they have a very big engineering team. LinkedIn, the same. Um, so 
those companies have very big teams. They can afford big investments. Um, they can afford lots of infrastructure. Surely Facebook has tens of thousands of servers. LinkedIn, probably the same. Well, most of us, who has a thousand servers? I don't think many people will have, okay? Um, so the whole point is you don't need any infrastructure. This is available for any site, small and large, like for a nonprofit or your local sports club to very big sites uh, for governments. The only thing you need is the ability to stream responses and not have buffering. And by default, Apache actually doesn't do buffering, so by default, any Apache installation is fine. Nginx actually has the ability to explicitly disable buffering, so any Nginx installation out there will, is guaranteed to work with BigPipe because BigPipe already sets that header. So you can get started right away. You don't need Varnish, you don't need a CDN, you don't need anything except a web server that doesn't do buffering. So that means it is for hobbyists and enterprises alike. It's a big step forward for everybody, and you don't need to learn how to set it all up. Um, in case you do have buffering, you may be wondering, does th do things break? Well, no, they just go back to the old way. Because in the end, what happens then is you get the entire response in one go, which means you didn't start receiving uh, the initial parts sooner. So nothing breaks, it's just back to the old, slower behavior. So if you have a crappy proxy in between you, so for example in schools or in some businesses, you have a proxy and you can not use the proxy, and some of those proxies unfortunately have buffering enabled. In those cases you won't see the speed boost you will see otherwise, but at least it still works. Everything is guaranteed to still work. So a few of the edge cases that some of you may be thinking about and wondering if they actually work. Uh, what about placeholders that aren't HTML elements like a div or um, uh, a image or whatever? Like HTML, we can easily query for. We can use uh, query selector all and find it efficiently using Big, Big Pipes JavaScript. That's what it does eff effectively. It finds some, some HTML and replaces it. But what if the thing we need to replace is somewhere deeper? Like, for example, an HTML attribute containing, for example, the form action URL, which is one of the examples that is, effect, is in fact a placeholder. Or maybe a CSRF token in a URL in an attribute. How do, do, how do those cases work? Because actually, those can slow your site down significantly as well. So we want to make sure that those also work. And they do, as I will show in a second. Another example is uh, if, if JavaScript is turned off. How do things then work? Fabian already, already mentioned that case. But that's really crucial that things still do work. And BigPipe, in fact, detects that case itself automatically. It detects whether JavaScript is off and ensures that everything continues to work just fine. Well, in both of those cases, we replace, so in the first case, we replace those few placeholders that are very tricky, that are inefficiently replaceable with JavaScript. Um, in the second case, every single uh, placeholder cannot be replaced by JavaScript because JavaScript is not turned on. Well, in those cases, we replace it without JavaScript. As Fabian explained, we send uh, the HTML until the first placeholder we encounter. We, don't, we stop sending, so we don't send everything, including placeholders, to the, to the client, to the browser. So we send just a part until the first placeholder, work to replace that, send that placeholder, then send the uh, subsequent HTML until the next placeholder. So we have Many, many small steps instead of being able to send a bit more at first, which is unfortunate, but at least you still have streaming, so it still makes things significantly faster. So in other words, BigPipe is always an improvement, even if JavaScript is turned off. So let's dive in, into a bit of the code details, and Fabian will explain that to you. OK, so um, to make your code not only BigPipe compatible, but generically Drupal 8 compatible, uh, you have to take care of some things. Uh, whenever you are rendering something, you have to think of our nice little language. That's kind of the trade-off or the contract we're doing here in Drupal 8. Um, you have to tell us what you are doing. If you have to give in Drupal 8 the information so that it can do all those things for you. So in practice, there's a little thought process. You can make a habit. Whenever you are rendering something, you must think of cacheability. Um, and when it's something that's expensive to render and it's worth caching, then you are setting cache keys on that object, obviously. So um, very simple, render caching, you just set the keys uh, and it works. So um, and then the other thing is, 
if this is varying by something, combination of permissions, URL, interface, language, whatever, then you need cache context. So user permissions, URL, just add it. Fortunately, uh, Drupal adds it already for many things automatically. That's very similar to HTTP's very header. Um, so, and if you have something, it causes the representation of the thing you are rendering become outdated, um, like the editor edits the node, then you need cache text, for example, for the node you are rendering right now. And uh, when it becomes outdated time-wise, then you're adding a max age. The standard for that is to cache permanently. Um, so all relevant objects within Drupal have this wonderful cacheable dependency interface where you can get the cache context, cache text, and max age. And that's implemented by almost everything in Drupal, configuration and all entities, content config, access results, block contact, condition plugins, etc., etc. So, and the other thing is you need to ensure that things are renderable in isolation. Blocks is one big use case, but you might have like more complex uh, layouts or something where you have something that needs to be um, also rendered in isolation. So you have like this current temperature uh, thing and the temperature from satellite to get that, that takes quite a lot of time because um, you have to get it from satellite. Um, in this case, it would run our ways. So one problem was you would add a cache, but it would still run our ways because uh, Drupal would just uh, execute this kind of render array. The cache would never do anything for you because the markup has already been created. So um, that kind of pattern you used in Drupal 7 for that was a pre-render cache pattern. You have some function that is building the markup for you with the pre-render and you're setting the cache with the keys and the max age. Um, so now the temp from satellite runs only if there's a cache miss, but it's not um, isolated because um, it can do anything in build. I could put in like um, a big object from the database and um, that way it depends on something. So if you want to have it um, isolate, the way to go is to replace a pre-render with a lazy builder. And you see the lazy builder, you're setting like, uh, it's like a callback like you used to. You have a function and then you have the parameters. And the parameters we are guaranteeing that need to be uh, Scala. So um, that's how you do that. Um, so because all the calculations happen in the callback, there's no more objects you are passing in, there's just scalar values, and that's very, very important because we need to cache whatever you are seeing here, we need to put that into the database. And you have to think, if you don't want that to be big, then make it small. Um, so once it's isolated and deferrable, then uh, we can big pipe it. Yeah, and uh, there's a nice little developer tool Vim wrote. Well, I, I wrote a prototype, as the URL still says. Um, so I think that in some cases this can become overwhelming. Like, if my page is varying by session, by user, by URL, by whatever, what the hell costs my page to vary by that thing? Or if my page is being um, is, is tagged by a certain cache tag, why is it tagged by that cache tag? And to be able to answer that question, I think it would be very cool, very valuable to be able to visualize that, much like uh, Firefox is able to do with uh, the, the DOM. So I'm not sure if you know, but Firefox, if you go to, into its web developer tools, click on elements, then it has a 3D mode, which flips the page in 3D and allows you to see how the elements are stacked on top of each other. Well, I, f I think that a very similar tool would be very valuable for visualizing cacheability metadata. It, it, it would allow you to say, okay, what are the tags on the page? Okay, given the tags, where does this tag come from? Where does this tag come from? So in this particular example, what I did was I asked, um, well, actually, let me open the image because it seems very small on the screen. Um, so in this case, what I'm looking at is a front page, and over here we have... Um, um, the timestamp, the time when the node was posted. And I asked, basically, I asked RenderVis to visualize what caused the time zone cache context, because there's many time zones, and the timestamps that, that you see are always varying by time zone, because 
if I'm here in New Orleans, there's a seven hour time difference with Belgium where I live. So that actually was a bug on Drupal.org actually at one point because we assumed that it was always fine to cache timestamps, but it's not because it needs to be customized to the current user. Um, so in this case, I'm, I'm asking, what is causing the page to vary by time zone? Well, it turns out that it's this timestamp, no surprise there. I asked it to visualize uh, how the time zone cache context, the first time it was used, is bubbled up. Well, actually, it's used here, and it's a field that is rendered as part of the node. This is, this is the node, the outline of the node, and the node is part of a view, so it bubbles up to the entire view. The view sadly still has several layers of divs and containers, so you see three outline containers, and then it bubbles up to the entire page level. And so being able to ask such questions and see what thing is causing a certain uh, lack of cacheability or poor cacheability, I think is very valuable. Um, and so if anybody of you is interested in helping out with this, because it's just a very hacky prototype at this stage, you can work on very cool uh, CSS3 animations and fancy things like that that you usually don't get to work on, well, come and talk to me. I would love to have your help. Um, so now that you have a good idea of how BigPipe works, now that you have a good idea of how uh, it is able to work, uh, what you can do with it, what you can expect from it, what are some other possibilities? Uh, well, we could add more placeholder strategies. As I mentioned before, there is a default one which Drupal Core uses and then BigPipe is a new one, but we could add more like ESI. We, we, there's no reason why we couldn't have an ESI strategy. The downside of ESI is of course that you need additional infrastructure, which is not the case for BigPipe. Um, another thing that could be very interesting based on all of this work is something like Turbolinks, um, where we would only load the difference between the current page and the next page. And we could do that because we have the cacheability metadata, so we know which parts are actually page specific and which ones aren't, so we can figure out which parts should actually be the same on this page and the next, so we can figure out which aren't so that we only load those. So that's a pretty cool possibility. Service workers, um, that would be very cool. Service workers are basically varnish, a reverse proxy on the client that you can control with your JavaScript code. So you can fully control what gets actually to the network because there is something in between the browser and the actual network. Um, and given that cacheability metadata, we could automatically ensure that whatever the service worker has cached in terms of responses is invalidated when necessary. For example, if it has cached the entire response for node five, and node five is updated, it would be able to be notified node five has been updated, and uh, that would allow it to work very efficiently. And that's just a handful of the number of possibilities. Yeah, and now Wim will show you something that you've not seen before, because he actually made something like Turbolinks possible, and that is coming now. <laughs> Thanks for the dramatic introduction. <laughs> uh, so it was actually first called Turbolinks, but the Turbolinks people didn't quite like it, so we had to rename it, and we called it Refresh Less, Refreshless. Um, it is Turbolinks, but better to the extent that uh, it is actually able to work automatically. You don't have to write any custom code, you don't have to do any integration, because it is able to once again reuse that cacheability metadata that Drupal is already providing. Um, and so what it does is it's automatic, it loads only the parts that change, and it relies on the cacheability metadata to make, it, to make page refreshes and navigating between pages much smoother. So a very quick demo of that that I recorded a long time ago before it was called Refreshless. Um, this is what it feels like to navigate between two pages without Turbolinks today in Drupal 8, and this is if you enable Turbolinks. So let me actually stress that once again, see how things are flickering and jumping about, and then, ah, peaceful. <laughs> And Turbolinks obviously has another advantage because we are sending way less data over the network for that because we are only sending those, uh, those, those parts that actually have changed. So there's also some uh, advantages there. Yep, and uh, well obviously the browser has to do less work which explains why it's so peaceful. Um, and Refreshless is something you can use and try today. Again, zero configuration, just download it and install it. It's in alpha state at this point. Um, it is not perfect yet, but it's getting there. It is approaching beta level stability, uh, but there is no consequences for you. You can install it and immediately remove it and give it a try. I welcome all feedback. And with that, we've had everything. So try BigPipe, try the demo, install it, give it a try, give feedback so that we can make it a stable module in Drupal 8.2, hey, hopefully, otherwise 8.3 maybe. 
um, and then everybody can benefit. Thank you. Big pipe affect document ready time. Uh, the question was, I'll repeat it because it seems like the mic is not really turned on, or it's turned on but not doing anything. Does big pipe affect document ready time? Um, it actually does, in the sense that it is able to uh, start loading the page much sooner, um, and so it is not going to wait for every single block to have appeared until the document is ready. Something else. Um, you're probably asking about the dome ready event in that um, and the answer is no. Um, I was not able to find a way how to actually trigger that event in a way. If someone knows, we are happy to add it. Um, but because in Drupal you should use Drupal behaviors, so you are also ready for Ajax, as long as you use Drupal behaviors, we are calling Drupal attached behaviors as soon as we've sent the first chunk. So the first JavaScript will already start uh, loading then. And that's how we um, avoid that limitation. Yeah, exactly. So that's why it's also able to make things work immediately before all of the things have arrived. But then as soon as something arrives, we also make sure behaviors are attached. So never use DOM ready in Drupal. Always use the proper abstraction. Uh, great, great presentation, great product. I have a question. You um, you gave a lot of great examples, like uh, the weather thing, like maybe uh, customizing content based on IP address or based on a cookie or a session or something like that. But then I also thought I heard you say it's only available to authenticated users. Is there, we don't authenticate, is there a way we can still use it? Um, you, can, uh, you can definitely use it also with uh, anonymous users. In this case, you would okay. probably want to create something where you kill the page cache. There are several methods which would be too detailed to outline now. Um, but um, this, the trick is kind of uh, the only thing you need to do, you put, you create a new cache context, my crazy thing. And for your crazy thing, um, what you would actually do is you would add that to the auto placeholding conditions. You would add that uh, cache context to your blocks, to whatever you are doing. If you need lazy load entities, we have some more work to do, but you could just put in a lazy builder for yourself for that part uh, that's independently buildable. And then you just let Drupal do its thing. It will automatically create a placeholder for you, and um, then you can make use of at least the dynamic page cache and big pipe automatically, no problems. Yeah, and one small addition and one follow-up question for you. Um, we said authenticated users, and that's actually not entirely correct. What, is, what it is is users that have a session. So anonymous, like e-commerce sites, that's a typical example, they have anonymous users, usually. But then as soon as they add something to a shopping cart, they have a session. BigPipe works for anything that has a session enabled. So authenticated users always have a session, but anonymous users that have a session because of some very dynamic thing, like a shopping cart, they also have BigPipe. So if it's just a session, if it's a site that is anonymous users, but there is a session for some personalization, that is taken care of automatically. So. Uh, hi. You said there's a different way that it works if, but it's still doing something if JavaScript is disabled. I was wondering how, we, how it detects that in order to know what to send. <laughs> Are you going to show the code? Yeah. OK. <laughs> yeah, this is how it works. <laughs> So what it does is, so the no script tag, that is something that wraps any HTML that is only relevant and that will interpret, be interpreted by a browser if no scripts are available, so if JavaScript is turned off. So that means that this meta tag, which causes a redirect to a URL that sets a Node.js cookie, um, this is only interpreted and seen by a browser if JavaScript is turned off. So when JavaScript is turned off, the first time you hit it with a browser that has JavaScript turned off, it follows a redirect, says a cookie, that is not used for anything except Node.js. And then it knows that JavaScript is turned off on the server side. Um, does the big pipe work on admin pages? And it doesn't even make sense to have it there. Um, so. 
it um, it should work on admin pages and um, it does not make total sense but um, for example at the moment forms are not cached um, so um, if you have a comment form um, that would for example come later in that so. Hi, are you aware or did you use at all any type of um, tool or methodology for reliably and objectively testing TTI? It seems very subjective. Is, am I wrong? It, it's a very good question. So the question is how, what, what is basically the best way to measure TTI in an objective way that's reliable? That's a very good question. Um, the only way that I personally know of is to use um, basically inject in the right place in the HTML a piece of JavaScript, a little bit of piece of JavaScript that marks that time because there is a resource timing and web performance timing specs that are supported by all browsers nowadays. And that allows you to measure custom, that allows you to add custom metrics for performance. And that is the best way I know of, but probably in your case you have some interactive JavaScript and you can run that measurement code just when your JavaScript has finished in initializing. Um, however, time to first byte is, is a pretty good measure, kind of in, um, it usually did match quite well. Um, at least browser timing, time to first byte is giving you an idea of how, what the time to interact could be in that. But yeah. It really depends. Yeah, okay, a, a, a JavaScript that you're creating a timing event with is still more accurate, that's true. I've got two questions. The, uh, the first one is, I've been working on some large governmental websites that have thousands of static pages, like news releases, government publications, and, and they use uh, Akamai caching for that, which, is, which makes it very fast, you know, because they're just all static. Would, would, would this eliminate the need for the Akamai in every case, or maybe would you still use it for something like that? Uh, um, I, it sounds like those, those pages are all static, so it's the same for everybody. So I don't think you would be gaining much with Big Pipe specifically, but the other things, the, the cache tags and so on, that is what would allow Akamai to be uh, invalidated more efficiently and precisely. So it would allow you to solve the problems of taking of the time between publishing something and actually seeing it as the end user, but that's not really what you're asking. You're asking, can I remove Akamai because this would solve it? Well, it really depends also on the latency between where your server is at and where the user is at. So it de there is no clear answer. Basically. Well, I would rather say the answer is no, because um, <laughs> Akamai is scaling for thousands of users, and um, this does not solve yeah. that problem of distributed global uh, things in that. Um, this is really for the personalized experiences and um, for such Akamai solutions that are customized, uh, yeah, Akamai has, I know that Akamai has some solutions for that. Usually you would still use Ajax for that and to get in the personalized parts. And um, while Drupal 8 can help with that, with other things that we have been doing, um, not specifically with that use case where things are like that. And, and my other question, and, and this is something that's always bothered me, it, it, I've always thought that a lot of web pages would have like a, a bunch of links on them and people often go to one page and they go to another page. But you can often predict what page they're gonna go to. I mean, you might have a page that like 50% of the people that go to that page also go to this, they click in this link and go to this next page. Why not, is there a way to like preload that intelligently? Or yes, something? well, intelligently, the, um, intelligently is a very difficult answer. The, the answer to is it possible, yes, and actually I think at this point almost every browser supports it, I forget the exact name, but in the head of the HTML you can specify a link tag that says uh, prefetch this page so that if the user actually goes there, the browser has already fetched everything and at this point it's even possible to have it pre-rendered so that you click it and it's there immediately. That part is possible, so you should look it up and I'm sure you will find it the exact name of how to do it. It's, it, it's not, a much, not much code, you just have to use the right notation. But the tricky thing is of course determining what is going to be the most popular thing. So intelligently, you would need to look at your traffic logs, I would say. Um, and you probably won't be able to do such an optimization for every page, but for a landing page that has the majority of people going to a certain next page, there you could yep. just do that. 
and as that secondary page is preloaded, big pipe would help load it faster. Mm. Um, well, it it would still have the same benefit in, as it would have for any other page. But in your case, you're asking, can I make it ready right away? Which browsers have a solution for? So BigPipe would still help, but it wouldn't, ha wouldn't help quite as much as just using the complete prefetching and pre-rendering that a browser can do nowadays. Great, thanks. So I do technical SEO, so I'm concerned about what the crawler sees and, and its behavior, and I know you know, we, we're not gonna send personalized content to a crawler, obviously, but I'm curious about the no script and the meta refresh, because we don't like to send crawlers to weird places, right? Have you, have you looked at that at all? So we would only send this JavaScript uh, with a meta refresh when the user actually has a session. Most crawlers don't have a session. Okay. As we said, we are still debating internally for big pipe for our anonymous users. It's possible, we'll probably make it possible, but maybe not enabled by default, but more make it an opt-in thing for sites that have that specific need. But because most Google crawlers are pretty anonymous, um, that should never affect them. Okay, you don't think they would execute that? Right, as long as they don't have a session, BigPipe is not enabled, and therefore, they won't get any of the special behavior. So first of all, thanks guys, this is really awesome stuff. Uh, coming at it from a front end point of view, I have a couple questions though. Um, <clears throat> going back to what you're saying about the jumpiness, um, do you have any actual recommendations for how to make how to make the CSS more robust? I'm thinking in terms of because I don't really understand caching that well for Drupal 8. Inside a block, you have CSS and, and divs and things. Is that all cached? And is that all that replaced in the placeholder, or is the placeholder inside those little divs uh, that gets replaced? Like, are you replacing content or the entire block? In this case, the entire block is replaced. There's a diff. We have an open issue that you all can contribute to if you want, um, where we are um, integrating a big pipe with the theme system. So you could, can have templates, and then you can have like um, like um, Instagram did it like this little previews. You could, for example, say. I create this kind of layout or block layout I, I want here. I put in like an image or I put in like some markup that's kind of the, the placeholder, maybe some little spinner, and then you can avoid the jumpiness also. And when your content arrived, it gets replaced. But yeah, that's, um, that's kind of the idea of where we're going. We are also debating if we have an outdated version of the page that we could send that with some special class outdated. Uh, to that template, and the template could decide, oh, I want to show the old version of that page, actually. So that would be another possibility to avoid some jumpiness because much con some content might not change as much as that it would be a problem. So, But there's still solutions in the works and debates around that. And obviously, if you have an inspiration, come to us, open an issue, and there's a lot to research. <laughs> First, a great, great session. Uh, very good information. Uh, we're on D6 right now, and we use auth cache module to uh, uh, cache the content for authenticated users. I'm wondering if this will help us replace that in Drupal 8. Um, yes or no? Yes, because dynamic page cache is actually exactly what auth cache do, does. Okay. So BigPipe builds up on top of that. So yes, it solves it, but it's not BigPipe specifically. That solved it. It's already solved in Drupal 8 without BigPipe. Dynamic page cache is very much what AuthCache does without the painful parts where you have to basically analyze your entire website to figure out which things are varying because which code paths are being executed. We, we don't have cacheability metadata in Drupal 7 or 6. We have that in Drupal 8, and that's why dynamic page cache is able to do what AuthCache does oh, out of the box. Because in AuthCache means we have a custom code where we set different cache tags like for the based on the language or user role or something and then we cache the content so is that 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 would be the cache context in Drupal 8 cache context replace this cache ID you can customize in auth cache and um, we have uh, some special variable renderer default cache context or something like that um, and um, there you can specify that your whole site everything that's ever cached render cached somewhere is varying by the moon cache context, as I said. So there's a variable to help you 
alter that and there's some lots of documentation you can look at and that should answer most of your questions. Okay, thank you. Entities and views, are they being rendered in isolation or not yet? They're not yet. I have got a prototype. It's possible. Um, the entity view builder is a little interesting code, um, which made it that a lot more complicated than I originally thought. Um, but yes, it's possible to render those in isolation. And actually, one of our earlier demos, it might have been LA or uh, Spain, um, there you can actually see entities being lazy loaded one after each other. Um, so it's possible, we just have to do the work. Thanks, I'll check it out. And views blocks, so views that are rendered in blocks are <laughs> served, because it's just a block once again, so it works. Cool, thanks everyone, have a good day. Actually, yes, I, I'm going to do that right now. So I actually had it ready. I just need to hit the publish button.